Ready? A very good afternoon to one and all. I, Dr. A. L. Sharma from Department of Physics, would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Central University of Punjab, Department of Physics, and my own behalf on this auspicious occasion of Foundation Week celebration of our university. Under the patronage of Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raghavendra P. Tiwari, Central University Punjab is celebrating its Foundation Week from 21st to 28th Feb 2022. On the, occasion of it, on the occasion of its 13th Foundation Day, which is to be celebrated on 28th Feb 2022. In this view, today we have with us an eminent scientist, Professor Dr. Rajiv Ahuja, Director IIT Roper. We heartily welcome you, sir, Thank you. Thank you. As, per, as per custom of our university, we start any of our program with university anthem. Therefore, I would like to request you all, dignitary and participant, to please rise for university anthem. Okay, so today's eminent pro speaker, Professor Rajiv Ahuja, who will be delivering his talk on very burning topic of today's scenario, that is advanced materials for energy applications. Before introducing our today's speaker, let me briefly introduce about our university and department. After establishment in 2009, Central University of Punjab is one of the fastest growing university with NAIC A grade. And the only newly established Central University which have consistently marked his place in top 100 NIRF ranking. Our Department of Physics started in 2013 with three faculties and seven to nine intake student in master program. Now we have 50 master intake capacity with eight faculty members. We are here, uh, Professor P. Prasant S. Alegaukar, head of the department, who is leading this department. We are having Professor S. K. Sarma, associate professor in this department, myself, Dr. Achila Sarma, assistant professor. We have with us Dr. Kamlesh Yadav, uh, assistant Professor, Dr. Ashok Kumar, Assistant Professor, Dr. Kishukant, Assistant Professor, and Dr. Saurabh Barua. So we all our faculty here, sir, will, all are welcoming you. Uh, 
we all faculty members are involved in different thrust area of research like energy magnetism water splitting computational and experimental physics etc since last 5 years faculty members of the department have published more than 100 research papers in high impact but high impact journals of uh, international repute under the dynamic guidance of our honorable vice chancellor our department is achieving new milestone now i would like to request professor sk sharma for introduction of today's speaker over to you sir uh, thank you dr sharma uh, and good afternoon everyone so it's my my great honor to introduce you today speaker today we have professor rajib ahuja uh, director of indian institute of technology with us so just to say few introduction about professor ahuja before joining as director at iit roper and dr ahuja was full professor of computational material science at uppsala university sweden and he is present uh, presently holding this position as a full professor there also he is one of the most highly cited cited researcher in sweden and india uh, professor ahuja has done his phd from iit roorkee in 1992 his main area of interest is uh, computational material science with focus on energy such um, batteries hydrogen storage and uh, production sensor as well as high pressure physics he has about 1030 research articles in peer reviewed journal with h index of 90 i10 index of 630 and number of citation more than 37000 of which more than hundreds are in high impact journal like science nature nature material physical review letter pns he is fellow of various international uh, bodies a few are royal society of chemistry uk american physical society usa he is associate associate editor of of nano energy the impact factor is around 18 he has many international awards to his credits uh, if you are beller lectureship for aps beating the wall mark prize royal swedish academy of sciences he is an elected member of swedish royal society of sciences board of european high pressure research group as well as the executive board of international association for advancement of high pressure science and technology Professor Ahuja has supervised 30 PhD students and more than 30 high postdocs from all over the world and he regularly acts as a reviewer of several international bodies uh, funding agency including National Science Science Foundation Department of Energy USA National Research Council Canada National Science Center for Poland and many more uh, European Science Foundation Uh, Strasbourg France he fund for scientific research FNRS Belgium and national research development and innovation office from Hungary IBS from South Korea uh, with this i would like to it's it's our great honor uh, to be here you sir so floor is yours sir uh, so you can start your uh, uh, presentation sir uh, th- thank you surrender Uh, can you hear me yes sir okay thank you surrender it was nice to see you uh, again and uh, i know you since we met in brazil uh, in rio and yes, uh, we have a nice time with, with you and your wife so i still remember those days and now uh, we uh, i am also in india and you are also in india so we in hope in future we don't need to go to brazil to meet each other right yes sir <laughs> so uh, so w- what i want to talk today actually uh, actually i have visited uh, your department before and on that day it was very informal discussion 
and uh, we want to take this discussion and convert into the collaboration. So that's uh, my idea. So we should use this as opportunity to go one step uh, up and to start collaborating because uh, time as time passes, as uh, things change, so we have to act very fast. So what I'm going to talk today, actually, I'm going to talk about today to the about the advanced materials uh, uh, for the uh, energy application. So you can see this is uh, the building, but uh, uh, this is the entrance of uh, uh, IIT Roper right now. But uh, since I am also at a uh, professor at uh, Uppsala University, so the so the so this is uh, you can see that uh, here the building uh, from Uppsala University and the lowest building here is, is we call it the Engstrom Lab, and this is uh, one of the biggest uh, materials research center in the northern Europe. Is a one of the huge center in Northern Europe. And then our University Uppsala is also more than 700 years old. And we rank top 50 in the world in, uh, when it comes to Uppsala University. And when we talk about uh, IIT Roper since I joined in, IIT Roper is a very young institute. Actually, we also celebrated yesterday our foundation day. So, and uh, we are also similar old, uh, that 30, this was also 13 year old. Actually, IIT Roper started in 2008, but at that time campus was, because our mentor IIT was IIT Delhi. So our uh, first year he started at IIT Delhi and we moved here in Roper in 2009. So we are in, in the same age. So, and so it means when you are in the same age, then it's easy to talk and easy to collaborate. So that's the advantage. So when we talk about the energy landscape, uh, so you know, uh, we are using different way uh, to store energy, to produce energy, and how we are using the energy. So nowadays, uh, wherever we go, we have whatever application we have, whatever we talk, we always talk about energy. Even we are sitting in this room and uh, we are running our laptops and uh, we need a battery for that. Also. So in every daily application, we need uh, energy and from where energy should come. Either it should come uh, from oil, gas, or the coal, or some kind of the renewable resources like uh, uh, solar or or you can say wind energy or, uh, or the wave energy. So if you look at uh, in the left-hand side, I have shown that energy supply, it can be nuclear, hydro, or solar. And on the right side, you can see that uh, how we are consuming in energy. So in between, you can see that there are many ways to store and transport the energy. For we have, we are talking about battery, we are talking about electrical storage. So when we talk about hydrogen, we are talking about hydrogen storage. So, uh, so what we want, uh, so we want to work on all three as aspects. We want to produce energy also, we want to store also, and, and how we utilize them. That is also one of the, uh, the key concern nowadays when people are talking. But when we are talking about energy, we being a material scientist and sitting in a physics department like you, so uh, how we uh, uh, how we want to go when we have the energy demand? So should we take hydro, or nuclear, or coal energy as a standard energy supply, or should we, when we talk about uh, new energy sources and uh, when we talk about uh, more sustainable energy sources, or when we talk about clean energy, we cannot use coal and oil and gas. So we have to find alternate. And uh, you can say we, when we are talking about batteries or solar cells, whatever we are talking, for that we need a material. So can we use the existing materials uh, or we can find a new materials? Problem is that we have the lot of materials which we like to use it and we are using that. But sometimes what the demand we are getting from energy sector, I don't think uh, we can fulfill that demand with the, the, the present material or present resources. So either we have to invent a new material or we have to design a new material or we have to find a new material or we have some existing material and we have to find the way how we improve that to those material for a sustainable application. So when we talk about materials, especially for energy application, we need a material for the power generation when people are talking about photovoltaic or we are talking about wind energy or fuel cells or thermoelectric 
city. And when we are also talking about here the transmission, and if you look at that, uh, if you talk to anybody in Department of Electrical Engineering, they will they will say that we have enough energy. We are losing so much energy in the transmission. 30, 40 percent energy. We have the energy losses when we transport uh, energy from power station to the house houses. So we have a lot of that losses. How if we can minimize those losses, we don't need to generate more power. We can use. We have enough power. If you talk to anybody working in electrical engineering. So what we want, we want a, a transportation, electrical transportation system where we have a minimum losses. We are talking about uh, like a superconducting power cables where the losses will be almost zero. So if we can make uh, in that direction also, we, if we use save energy, that is also a, a production of energy. And same thing uh, uh, when we, we have a big transformer, so we should use uh, a superconducting transformer to save, uh, to save energy. And when we're talking about nowadays about the consumption, and you know that a few years back, the LED got Nobel Prize. Uh, so we are talking about solid state lighting. So we are we want to change uh, our household appliances or lighting in the household with LEDs. So we can reduce the uh, consumption, the voltage, volt, voltage, voltage of the of the energy. So suppose if we have a hundred watt bulb, we can use the if you use LED, you can use maybe two or three wattage uh, LED lamp that will give you the same amount of energy or light. So, so that is the one way uh, we are talking about nowadays. Where, so we are not producing energy with LED, but we are saving and saving is also a production. Then we talk about the storage and you can storage, you can have a battery, you can have a super capacitor or even the magnetic energy storage we are talking. So, so if you want to have a, a, a sustainable development, we need advanced material. And this advanced material, I, I cannot search myself uh, as a being a computational material scientist. And you as experimental scientist or doing experiment cannot do themselves also because we need a, a, a guidance from somewhere so we can design a material with the desired properties. So this is what uh, I was talking about that uh, the battery, what we are using every day with the lithium cobalt oxide battery. So good enough have got the Nobel prize. And you, you will be surprised that good enough, good enough is almost 97 year old and he's still active and he's still working. And this work he has done on this lithium cobalt system is way back in 70. So sometime uh, you have to wait to get Nobel prize and, and now the Nobel committee recognize how important are the batteries in 2009, they, they, he got the uh, prize in chemistry, Nobel Prize uh, together with Steinle Whiteman. So when we talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, collaboration, actually, so when we talk that we cannot achieve things by our own, so we have to collaborate. So this is an example I always give because uh, since I, was working for last 30 years in Uppsala. So this is an example I took from Uppsala University. Maybe you know these two famous people, at least you know, should know, and they're Celsius. Celsius, who has given this temperature scale, you do every day, you, when you talk about temperature, how many degree of temperatures, you talk about such a degree Celsius. So Celsius was a professor in our department in Uppsala. And the other guy on the left-hand side, his name is Carl Warnini. If you are working in plants or botany, everybody know Linnea. Linnea is known as the father of the, who has given the classification of the plants. Whatever classification of plant exists now, it was given by Linnea. Linnea was a professor of, of medicine in 1741. And you can see that uh, Ander Celsius was a professor of astronomy in 1730 in Uppsala. So, one day uh, they have a meeting like, like us, like we are talking. At that time, we don't have internet. And they one, once they meet and then uh, Linnea asked Celsius, uh, not Celsius, his first name is Anders because in Sweden, we never called you by your last name. We always call you your first name. He asked Anders, I heard that you have a temperature scale. And I heard that you say that in temperature scale, water is boiling at zero degree and melting at hundred degree. And then he told Anders, uh, Linnea told to Anders, it, it sounds to me very awkward. 
why don't you revert your scale that the, the water should boil at 100 and freeze at zero? So Anders liked that idea and he revert the scale. So this is, you can see that uh, he was from physics and the linear was from medicine. When they talk and Anders get the idea and he revert the scale. Otherwise you will be right now, even today you will be using the water is boiling at zero degree if this collaboration doesn't exist. So collaboration is nowadays is very important and without collaboration, we cannot achieve the thing what we want to achieve because we are not expert for everything. Something you know better than us and something I know better than you, so we have to work together. And same thing in all faculties. If you go to, we have to collaborate on university level, we have to go to international level. So we have to work in a, in a collaborative mode. And the pandemic, uh, what we have seen in the last two years, pandemic has taught us that uh, if we want to survive, we have to work together. And nowadays, uh, collaboration is not that difficult because we can talk like I'm talking to you, right, sitting here. We can collaborate also in the, the same way. So, so distance is no problem right now. So when we talk about uh, energy, as you can see that uh, uh, where the most of the energy demand coming and how will we are fulfilling the energy demand. So if you look at uh, in uh, right now, the situation is like that 80% of the uh, energy demand is fulfilling by either coal, oil, or gas. And the rest comes the hydroelectric, nuclear, or, or renewable sources. So you can see that the 20% uh, is only the rest. And, and the renewable is also a very small amount. So how we can change it? So this big 80% or how we can reduce this 80% to maybe 40% and we should uh, put more effort on the renewable side and develop more uh, solution, more energy ways to generate the solution in a renewable way. So this is a big challenge. And, and uh, as I already told you that no one can achieve by, by their own. So there are many solution has been uh, proposed. And one of the uh, sustainable solution could be the the hydrogen economy. So nowadays, uh, I can I can guarantee you, if you go anywhere in Europe, or even in India or in Asia, everybody want to go for a hydrogen. So all the European countries want to go for a hydrogen. So this is an alternate for their their thinking for oil and gas. And India is not also far behind. And this was the address of our Prime Minister. Uh, Shri Modi ji, and uh, this was, was announced on the last, on 15th of August last year on the Independence Day. And they are going to put, put almost 100 lakh crore in Gati Shakti scheme. And if you look at what is the Pradhan Mantri Gati Shakti scheme is basically, is a setting up a national hydrogen mission to make India the new global hub of green hydrogen and its larger exporter. So this is the right time where we can all join a hand and we can make India is the hub of the green hydrogen energy. And we have a lot of demand within India. So we have to work together how we can produce hydrogen, how we can store and how we will use that. So this is a is, is, is very hot topic nowadays and not only all over the world, but in India also and going for hydrogen. When we talk about hydrogen, you can say that uh, when we are talking about hydrogen economy, uh, is this is a new idea? I will say, no, this is not a, a new idea. And if you look at uh, this is a quote I put here, one of the famous novelists, his name was Julius Verne. If you are a kid, you maybe you have read his novel called Mysterious Island. It, and that was written in 1874. In 1874, he already said that he was a just novelist. He was not a physicist or chemist or any technocrat. So he write, water will be the coal of the future. He said that when the deposit of coal are exhausted, we can heat and warm ourselves with the water and water will be the coal of the future. Because at that time, we are using energy source. And uh, he already said that at that time, uh, we will not get enough coal in the future and we have to re rely on the water. 
And this is also the crux of the hydrogen energy because when we talk about hydrogen economy, so basically what we, we want to take water and we want to break water into hydrogen and oxygen and we want to use hydrogen as an energy carrier in terms of when we talk about hydrogen economy. Why hydrogen economy? Because we know that what is the advantage of having hydrogen economy? We know that hydrogen is the one of the most abundant element on the earth. It's very renewable and it's very clean. And it packed the highest energy per unit mass of any element. You can see that if you look at the periodic table, hydrogen is the lightest element with the atomic number one. And it's very clean in the sense because hydrogen you don't get in the uh, free in the environment. It's always associated with water. So you get uh, in form of in the water. So it's very clean. So when we talk about hydrogen economy, so we talk about uh, hydrogen economy, there are three pillars of hydrogen economy. One, we can say we have to produce hydrogen and other is we have to store hydrogen and then we have to use. So we can store hydrogen, we can produce. So you can produce hydrogen. Uh, people are now talking about the photocatalysis or you can uh, yeah, burn, the, you can use the biomass to create, to generate hydrogen or you can take in photocatalysis, you can use sunlight and break uh, uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. So we have, we can, we can, uh, we can produce hydrogen. And in the Punjab government, they have a big program, and they want to uh, generate hydrogen from biomass. And then you have to store hydrogen also. For example, if you want to use hydrogen in mobile application, I mean in transport sector, then you have to think also about storage. How should you should store the hydrogen? Otherwise. You can all produce and you can do, you directly use that uh, in your station or or in houses, you can use directly. But if you want to use for transport sector, then you have to store also, because you want to use in your car or buses or train or in the buses, then you have to store also. So you can see that there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges. For example, uh, we have right now a very 9 million ton of year of hydrogen production, but we need like a 40 million tons. And the storage also, you can store in the gaseous form because hydrogen can exist in gas, solid and liquid. So you can store a gaseous form or you can have a, 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 a liquid storage or you can have a, a storage in the solid state form. And uh, so if you look at in the, when you have a, in gas, uh, in, uh, hydrogen in the gaseous form, then you, it, it gives you around 4.4 millijoule per liter of energy. You can talk about energy in millijoule per liter. So, and if, if you have a using liquid, then you get around 8.4 millijoule. And, but, but for the uh, real application, because we are competing with oil and gas with the, with the combustion engines. So we have to be, our uh, solution should be comparable or at least uh, equal to the, uh, what we are using right now, the technology of otherwise, why customer will buy a hydrogen driven car when, when he can have a cheaper car with the oil and gas. So we have to make the technology comparable. So customer will like to buy you know, on the same price as the, the hydrogen driven car. And then how we use basically we use in the uh, hydrogen when we store, we can use the uh, 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 fuel cells. So when we are talking about nowadays, uh, Toyota has a model where they are using fuel cells. But problem in fuel cells also somehow it's expensive because in fuel cells, we are using platinum as a catalyst. So platinum is uh, very expensive. So we have to find a new material or we have to find some kind of other plat catalyst which can be cheaper and we can cut down the cost of the fuel, uh, fuel cells. So, so we have to work on all these three sets. So if you, I am not going to talk about production and storage and I will uh, production and uh, fuel cells. So I will talk about only the storage and how uh, we can tackle the one issue at one time, the high storage of hydrogen. For example, when we talk about uh, transport sector, so you, 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 you have to see that we have to compete with oil and gas. So we need a very high gravimetric and volumetric density material where hydrogen can be there. So if we want a good hydrogen storage material, it should have at least 20 or 15 to 20 weight percent of hydrogen in it. Otherwise it's not viable. And uh, when we take hydrogen from the system, when we are talking, 
it sh which should be also easy to put it back in the uh, in the system because uh, like you want to charge and uh, battery every time so we, when we take our hydrogen system we have to put it back also the, so that this reaction should be reversible it should be kinetic should be very fast and there should be effective heat transfer it's a long uh, cycle lifetime for hydrogen desorption and absorption so we can uh, take it hydrogen and put in hydrogen in the system and then of, of course then uh, safety is also and the cost is also uh, issue so when i'm talking this hydrogen storage i'm not going to talk about uh, liquid or, uh, or or gas storage i'm talking about uh, solid state storage so that was the requirement which i told so we can have a material where we can put hydrogen in and when we need it we can take out hydrogen of the system so this I already discussed in the previous slide that uh, if you have a gaseous storage and uh, basically uh, you have to use uh, hydrogen gas under pressure. So if in your car you have a gaseous uh, hydrogen storage tank, it will with under pressure, it will be like a hydrogen bomb. So it's a safety issue. You will not drive your family uh, with hydrogen gas cylinder. You will avoid it. And when we have a liquid storage, when the liquid storage is also very expensive because you have to cool down below the uh, liquid nitrogen or cryogenic temperature. So that will be very uh, um, costly affair if you want to use the liquid hydrogen. But, and that's why I am talking here, why I'm talking about the solid state hydrogen, because that is the cheapest and the safest way to store hydrogen. When we talk about, uh, when because I already talked about that, uh, if you look at the Department of Energy target, they say that a material should have like nine, eight percent of uh, hydrogen in the system that could be a good candidate for uh, for hydrogen storage material. If we talk about nine weight percent uh, for hydrogen storage, so then we don't have much choice left because then in the periodic table we have only these few elements, the lighter elements. Because if we take high, heavier elements, the hydrogen weight percent will go down. So this material will be very happy. So your uh, your car uh, weight you want the weight, car weight of the car should be less because then you want to get higher mileage if your tank is weight of your car is 50 50 percent then you don't want to make that kind of tank so you want a tank also with a lighter material so so we have we need a lighter material for mobile application and when we talk about the stationary application weight is a not a concern and and then when we when we talk in the beginning that uh, uh, what kind of the, this material, how how this material should be like that. Uh, this material should be uh, not very strongly bound with the hydrogen. It should be the bonding should be, be between uh, ionic or covalent because if it's very strongly bound, it will take a hard time to take out the hydrogen from the system. So what is the ideal bonding? So we need hydrogen should come out uh, from the system around room temperature. So we need a bonding which should not be very strong and we should not be very weak. And when we are playing, uh, being a computational uh, material scientist, we can play with those materials and we can find the way if there is some existing material, it's good material, but the, the desorption temperature of hydrogen is very high. So we don't need to advance any material. We can find a way how I can reduce the desorption in those materials. So we can, play with the chemistry of the materials and uh, like uh, we can use the catalysis or we can use the nano structure. So we can play with the material science materials and we can design a material in, for example, in computers and then we can go to our experimental colleagues and to design those materials. So this is the priority table I want to show that if you want to have a hydrogen storage, so you have to forget about actinides or rare earths or even, even heavy transition metal. So you have only SP system or in the beginning S system. So these are the lightweight system you can consider for storing the hydrogen. So when we talk about hydrogen economy, if you talk, uh, what is a wish of the people who are working in the area of hydrogen economy, this is my wish. So I can have a plane, we can fill with the water and then we go all around the world. So this is the wish and what people are working in the hydrogen economy. And it's very difficult to realize. So this is a, as I told you, this is a wish and we put it very high goal and we have to work those goals in a collaborative manner to achieve this. 
So since uh, my background is a uh, computational material science, so we are doing, uh, uh, com uh, we will say, we are doing computer experiments in the comp uh, computer experiment. We are not doing experiment in the labs as uh, you as experimental people doing. We are doing experiment in the computers. And uh, this is not easy to do computer experiment also because uh, when I tell you something, uh, or if I give you some number or I tell you something new material, and you will tell me how I can trust you. So we have to make a theory very accurate and very predictive. So my experimental colleagues can trust on me and they can take this as a forward and make a real those materials. So how I make our uh, theory so predictive. So we are doing the calculation. We are not doing model calculation. We are doing a calculation based on the quantum mechanics. So, but we are doing with the, we are solving the quantum mechanical equation with the help of supercomputers nowadays. And you can see that the field of this, um, when we talk about quantum theory and electronic structure, which is the basis of the computational material science, you can see that uh, this field is started by Planck when Planck has given his hypothesis, then you saw the Schrod Schrodinger equation, uh, time independent equation, then it come time dependent equation and Dirac equation and big breakthrough came and then in the meantime, also there are many different electronic structure method developed to solve those Schrodinger equation. And big breakthrough came when Walter Cohn has given the density functional theory in 1964. And that make the breakthrough in the electronic structure. Theory. So we can solve the Schrodinger equation in a reasonable time for a very complex system. If we don't have a DFT, we cannot solve even hydrogen atom problem, single atom problem. So we should thank to Walter Cohn to make this. We, we are talking about now millions of item uh, computation. We are talking about ab initio calculation is thanks to Walter. And he got a uh, Nobel prize in 1998 for uh, density functional theory. So when we want to store hydrogen in a system, we can store a hydrogen in the system in two way, either you can say in a chemisov way or a physisov way. What you mean the chemisorb wave? In chemisorb wave, basically what happened, a hydrogen molecule interact with the materials and then it goes inside the material and form a very strong bonding with the material or with the lattice. And in, in when we have a physisorb system, basically what happened, the hydrogen molecule just remain on the surface of the material and it's very weakly bound through the Van der Waal forces. So in chemisorb system, the bonding is very strong but in physics of system, bonding is very weak. So if I want to take hydrogen out of the chemis of system, I have to put a lot of high energy or very high temperature to take out. But in physics of system, hydrogen automatically come even at room temperature, below room temperature, hydrogen will come out from the system. So we cannot use this material. We want to use a material around room temperature. So we have two system. One, we have to decrease the desorption temperature like in chemis of system. And other is a physics of system where I have to increase the desorption temperature of hydrogen. So these two systems are contradict system. And how I can find a same solution for both chemisol and a, a physics of system. So when we talk about uh, hydrogen economy or uh, is uh, how, why I say hydrogen economy is a sustainable economy. So we talk about the hydrogen cycle. Basically what we do, so we start hydrogen molecule a water molecule. So you break water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. Then we can store hydrogen in this box. And then we can use this hydrogen in the fuel cell and we can convert to chemical energy to electrical energy. Then hydrogen come out and combine again the oxygen of the environment and form again water. So basically what you see, you start with the water and you end up with the water. So this is a very sustainable loop and hydrogen loop. So you start with the water. This is the most cleanest way to produce, to use the energy. So when we talk about hydrogen storage, you can ask uh, uh, how, um, uh, what kind of material I should use for hydrogen storage. storage. Because I told you in the beginning, uh, if you don't want to use hydrogen for mobile application, then you don't have to worry about storage. storage. But if you want to use for car, buses, then we have to talk about the storage issue. So if you take a car and if I want to drive this car 500 kilometers, 
so if i take hydrogen uh, as the gaseous form so i need at this size of tank the bigger tank and here hydrogen is at 200 bar of pressure and then i say okay i don't want to use a high pressure hydrogen because it's like a bomb i say i i, I use a liquid hydrogen so is a liquid hydrogen if i want to use you, i can reduce the size by further by factor of 2 the uh, tank size but again you know that in liquid hydrogen i have a problem that i have to cool it down so i need lot of energy to cool down hydrogen below the tyconic temperature and then if i use some kind of hydride you can see that we can reduce further the size of the tank and you, if you see that when we are talking about the size of the tank re reduction if you look at lanthanum nickel material this is very heavy material so the weight percent of hydrogen is very small in this one so right now when we are talking about the material for hydrogen storage we are not talking of this kind of material we are talking about light complex metal hydride where lithium uh, sodium aluminum those kind of material not lanthanum lanthanum is very heavy so what will happen in this kind of material like if you use a, a lanthanum nickel uh, uh, 5h6 the weight percent of hydrogen in this system is only 2 weight percent so that's why the reduction is very low in the cell, uh, tank size but now we have a material where we can put up to 15 to 20 weight percent of hydrogen so think about how much i can reduce the tank size i can go one fourth of the size of magnesium nickel hydrogen for my tank size so you can see the how far i can reduce the size of the my tank and and we always say that solid stored uh, storage hydrogen is a safe best way and it's a cleanest way to store hydrogen so so we are working uh, on this direction uh, when we talk about these material these material come in the class of the chemizo material and you can ask uh, do you have we have a materials which can fulfill this requirement of course we have many materials either we can for good thing for us being a computational material science we can uh, we can design a material but it's very difficult for a, the experimentalist think about a new material with high weight percent and design them in the lab it will take years but when we do computer experiment we can design any material with the specific properties or we can use existing materials and we can try to improve those materials and for example if i take a material like lithium boron hydrogen core it can have almost 20 weight percent of hydrogen in the system and uh, but look at the desorption temperature when it's right dec 553 kelvin so it means i want desorption around 300 kelvin because if i want to use this system uh, for its storage application because i want hydrogen should come out from the system at a, at a room temperature so i cannot use this system as it is so what i say i can okay i can use this system and i can reduce the desorption temperature then i can use this system and then computational material science start to play important role so i can take this material and i can find a suitable catalyst or or nano structuring i can use and i can reduce this desorption temperature and there are another material called uh, sodium alanate again the problem the here is the more than 58% of hydrogen and the desorption temperature is 520 kelvin so again here also i have to reduce the desorption temperature so if anybody who start to working in hydrogen storage area so they start with the sodium alanate and sodium aluminum h4 so this is the testing material of people are working in the hydrogen community so uh, so we have also uh, work uh, on two class of materials uh, which is uh, we call is the chemisol material and the physisol material and in physisol material uh, we were talking about like uh, mofs nowadays is very uh, many people are using mofs uh, metal organic framework for different application not only for Uh, even CO2 reduction, CO2 storage, they are using MOF, and even medical application people are using MOF. And then we have a um, uh, other chemisorb system like uh, light metal hydride, the system that we are talking. Uh, I have shown in, in in the previous slide. So if I take uh, uh, material like sodium alanate, if I want to take uh, hydrogen out of this system, and you can see that hydrogen doesn't come. in a, in a one shot out of the system you have a three different reaction and these three different reaction, uh, reaction plays take place at very different temperature 
and you can see that at the, here the temperature I have given in centigrade. And if you want a room temperature, it should be around uh, 25 degrees Celsius, right? So if you look at the, uh, this reaction, temperature is too high, I cannot use. And further that these reactions are not reversible. So when I can take out hydrogen from the system, but I cannot put it back. So if we want to take this reaction reversible and how to make uh, this desorption low, that was the main task. Then some experimentalist people find that, that if they add a titanium trichloride as a catalyst in this system, all of a sudden this uh, desorption temperatures goes down and all these three reactions become reversible. And they were using titanium trichloride. And we say, okay, why titanium trichloride? And okay, my desorption temperature goes down. Can I find a new catalyst where my desorption temperature can go further down? Or I can find a better cat catalyst, even cheaper than titanium. Like if I make a catalyst with iron, that will be iron trichloride, but that will be much cheaper than titanium trichloride. So we looked uh, the whole periodic table and with that uh, uh, um, ob uh, objective, and I can tell you, I, I give a, here one simple example. I take sodium al alanate, sodium aluminum four, and I want to take hy one hydrogen out of this system. And if I want to take one hydrogen out of this system, basically I need around four electron volt of energy in the pure system. So now I say, okay, now I add the catalyst like titanium trichloride, and I dope this material with the titanium trichloride. And all of a sudden, when I now with the dope system, I want to take one hydrogen out of this system. This removal hydrogen removal energy goes 1.9 electron volt. So four to nine, 1.9 electron volt. So I can reduce desorption energy by a factor of two. Just I can half just using a catalyst. So what catalyst uh, do, and uh, we can explain why catalyst is helping. But catalyst is what catalyst is doing. Catalyst is making like titanium. It's making the aluminum hydrogen bonding weaker. So I can take out hydrogen out of the system at low temperature. So then we screen a lot of catalysts. We don't want to take as a heavy catalyst because the weight is a concern. So I took some uh, uh, like a 3D transition metal. And here I applied on Y axis hydrogen removal energy versus uh, different kind of catalyst. And you can see when uh, this catalyst can sit on sodium side or it can sit on the aluminum side and you can see the hydrogen removal energy. And if we talk about uh, titanium trichlorides, if you have hydrogen removal energy somewhere here around zero electron volt, this is, the, I have to, I have scaled, it's not zero, but I, I have scaled those energy. If I take iron trichloride, I can have this hydrogen removal energy almost factor of three down by minus three electron volt. So I can reduce further the hydrogen removal energy from the uh, from this system uh, from zero to three electron volt. So iron trichloride work much better than titanium trichloride as a catalyst if you see that. And you can ask me why iron works better than titanium. And there is the example. So what we done, uh, we have plotted the distance uh, uh, of hydrogen distance, no, no, transition metal like titanium distance with aluminum and titanium distance with the sodium as a function of the, uh, of, of the uh, catalyst. The cat catalyst can be titanium, iron, nickel, uh, or cobalt. And you can see that, and then we plot that uh, bond, bond length, bond distance. And you can see that uh, if you, in this figure, you can see that uh, on the, for the iron, the bond distance between uh, transition metal and aluminum is less than 2.5 angstrom. And on the right hand side, you can see the removal energy is also lowest for iron. Uh, so it correspond to, uh, directly correspond to the uh, aluminum transition metal distance, so iron aluminum distance. If I can find a catalyst, if I can further reduce this iron aluminum distance, I can reduce hydrogen removal energy even much lower and we can, when we say when we can removal energy is lower because my energy is lower, I can calculate temperature. E is equal to KBT, I can calculate the temperature. So my desorption temperature is going down. So, so this is the way. Then I ask our experimental catalyst, why you say that the titanium chloride is a best catalyst? If you want to know in, uh, 
in the people working in the hydrogen storage community, especially when they're working in the chemisorb system, they are using ball milling technique. In ball milling time, uh, in ball milling technique, so they mix the mixture of two elements and they grind it and or ball mill it. So they don't know what is the optimum time of ball milling. So they take half an hour for half an hour for ball milling for every catalyst. And then they see, okay, titanium in half hour, you give the best result. So, but uh, they should know that uh, iron uh, uh, hardness and or properties are different with the titanium. So maybe you need more grinding time to iron to mix it than in half an hour. If you increase the grinding time of iron, maybe iron will, will work much better than titanium. So then when we propose that, so they increase their uh, grinding time and they also find that the iron is a better catalyst than titanium and it's much cheaper because we have abundant of iron. So this was a one example. And then I can give you one example uh, on nanostructuring. Uh, I would like to ask how much time I have. Hello? Sir, 10 to 15 minutes. OK, OK. So, so now take I take one example of nanostructure material, how nanostructuring can help to reduce the desorption temperature. So I took a simple example, a magnesium dihydride. Why I took a simple example? Because when you take a simple example, you can explain physics and chemistry very well. And then you, then you can take this to the complicated system. And then you want to do this, we are doing computer experiment. So we need a, a computer experiment should be finished in, a, in our lifetime. So we want to take simple system and guide the simple system and to guide to experimental uh, nanostructuring can help or not. So look at the magnesium hydride. It's a very good system. Very, it can has a six weight percent of hydrogen in the system. There are a lot of problem with this system. Also, the kinetic was not good. The pattern is not reversible. So we uh, we started, okay, we can take this uh, material, bulk material, and we start the, uh, uh, we make it a nanomaterial and how we can reduce the desorption temperature or, and make these reactions reversible. So we, we done that way. And uh, we make a, a cluster when we uh, mimic the, uh, the nanomaterial, we make a cluster. And uh, we saw that uh, if you have around 100 atom, like uh, you have a, a magnesium, 30, 32 magnesium, uh, atom and 64, uh, that can be uh, a good system, test your hypothesis. And when, then we make a model, uh, like uh, when we talk about model, model means not the model, I mean, uh, we have to make a structure of the cluster and then we solve those equations uh, quantum mechanically. So we make a cluster, we make a cluster with uh, magnesium 30 and then we add a catalyst on that one. Uh, like in this case, if we take one atom, we add for titanium vanadium, and and this uh, and we have a hydrogen. And if you can see that uh, uh, the hydrogen can be in three different sites. It can be in the center side, it can be on the surface, and it can go on the edge also of the system. And then we done what we done. Uh, I will not show go in detail. And what we done, we done the similar kind of simulation, and we say that uh, is nanostructuring is helping me or not and or the what we have used catalysis plus nano structuring is helping me or not and to reduce the disruption temperature so we took one example and if you look at in this figure if you take a, a pure system mgh2 and you do nano structuring actually and then you took a hydrogen out of the system uh, from the center edge or surface it uh, it requires the same amount of energy to take out hydrogen in the system. And if you look at uh, this green line, actually I need my hydrogen desorption energy in that range if I want to use this system for a mobile application. Then we try to put uh, this thing, a different kind of catalysis like titanium, vanadium, iron, and nickel. And you can see that desorption energy goes down when we use nickel as a, capital, uh, as a catalyst and nickel can go, um, this hydrogen will be in three different situations. And you can see that uh, 
uh, nickel is a, one of the best catalysts here in case of this one. And if you look at the, this is we try to compare with one experimental data. And if you look at the absorption peak, desorption peak of hydrogen in this system, in pure hydrogen, uh, magnesium dihydride, is it, it is around 400 degrees centigrade. But if you use a different kind of uh, catalyst, if you use a nickel nano, nickel micro, nickel uh, nano, you can see that the desorption can reduce from around 350 to almost 250 degrees centigrade. So you can see that here also the work, uh, catalyst work to reduce the desorption temperature. So you can shift the desorption take of hydrogen in this system also uh, by, by 100 degrees centigrade. So again, the nanostructuring doesn't help that much, but the catalyst again help you to reduce. And the last example I want to take as a physics of system is a metal organic framework. So we have a many class of metal organic framework. And uh, so basically you have a, here you have an organic framework and it's, it's like a porous materials. You have a lot of pores where you can put hydrogen in and then when you want, you can take out hydrogen out of the system. So we took one of the uh, simple example in this case, we took the, we call MOF5. And problem was this also that hydrogen come out from this system at very low temperature, already 77 Kelvin, all hydrogen come out from this system. So here we have a different problem that here I have to increase the desorption temperature. So hydrogen should come out around the room temperature. So what we done, we done the same technique and we apply, uh, we use catalyst here also, and then we use uh, lithium here, lithium trichloride kind of catalyst or lithium. Uh, I didn't use lithium trichloride, but I use lithium. Why I use lithium? Because lithium is very light. So my weight percentage of hydrogen will not go down if I use lithium. If I use a heavier catalyst, my weight percentage of hydrogen will also go down. And then we decorate this system. And uh, then we have uh, done the molecular dynamics kind of simulation. And we have pl plotted the pair distribution function. And I can tell you that uh, if you're looking at this pair distribution function, and uh, uh, I can increase the desorption peak, uh, uh, or I can reduce uh, the desorption peak to the higher temperature side. Uh, for example, uh, if I, uh, when I decorate with the lithium, my, my weight percent little bit goes down because before we have a hydrogen, now we have a lithium. Lithium is a little bit heavier than. So you look look at that at the ambient pressure, uh, at ambient condition without any catalyst. Uh, for example, this is I just say some example. Uh, hydrogen weight percent in this system is around 3.5 weight percent, 3.5 weight percent. But the desorption was 77 Kelvin. But now I can you can see that I have written here, I can increase the desorption temperature from 77 Kelvin to 200 Kelvin, but I still can have 2.9 weight percent hydrogen in the system. And temperature to 300 Kelvin where I want, but still keep two weight percent of hydrogen in the system. So we have many cough where we can have a 20 weight percent of hydrogen in the system, no worry. Why I took this system only 3.5 weight percent? Because this is a smallest system in the category of the MOF. So, uh, if we take a complicated MOF, bigger MOF, I can have a weight percent of 10, 20 weight percent is no problem. So what idea, what I was showing that here also catalyst can use to increase the desorption temperature. And now GM Motors has a big program. Before they want to go for a chemise of system. And now they find out that it's very difficult to decrease the desorption temperature. It's, but it's easy to increase the desorption temperature. So they want to go for a physics of system for, especially for the uh, mobile application, but especially for the cars for the future. And with that, I will like to stop here. This is, I want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators and, uh, and our funding agencies. And I would like to thank you all of you uh, for your time and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Actually, uh, now session is open for questions. If anyone have, please. 
sir, what are the prospects for transition metal dichalcogenides uh, for hydrogen storage? You know, now that uh, we are talking about uh, this, you are talking about 2D materials, right? And these are all transition metal dichalcogen, MOS2. And so we are not talking about nowadays bulk. We are all talking about 2D dichalcogenides. And 2D materials has a very good prospect. And uh, these are a layered materials. So we have a very big surface area to attach hydrogen. So people are working for hydrogen storage also for the uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, in terms in, when we talk about 2D materials. And not only di transition metal di di um, dichalcogenide, but other 2D materials like uh, graphene-like materials, silicine, phosphorine, all these germine, they want to use also for hydrogen storage, as well as the photocatalysis. Okay, sir. Sir, what about uh, such type of ionic salts like LACL or PLACL? Because then, uh, this uh, absorption process will be easier. Right? I mean, this is the initial phase. Okay, okay. But uh, I have not seen any work, but uh, people, if you look at the organic chemists, uh, in, uh, and uh, because we, when we were talking about inorganic, they were just talking about uh, the lighter uh, hydrides only, the complex metal lighter hydride or the chemical sense. But uh, I have not seen any work uh, with the salt or anything, the people working in the hydrogen com community storage community they are using. Sir, I'm a little bit curious about actually one question I do have also. Sir, what we have seen here, the desorption peak are so sharp, what you have shown there, uh, desorption peak are sharp, but uh, my little uh, curiosity is that uh, especially in India, geographical scene is, especially it's a uh, temperature variation is around 75 to 80 degrees centigrade. So if suppose something we are going to create such types of device of such a uh, specific temperature of these options. No, 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 we are not talking. I say ideal material is that where this option is around room temperature. So it can be 40 degree also. I didn't say that. That uh, because we don't want that this option should be 70 degrees centigrade. Because then you have to heat your system. Otherwise, how hydrogen will come out? Right, so and that sharp desorption peak uh, because that is the simulation. It's not a, it's an experiment. So this is a calculation. So in calculation, if you plot the pair distribution function, you can smooth in with the Gaussian. You can get a, a not very sharp. You can get a very smooth and like that. Okay. And uh, desorption, I think if you can give me a material, even forty degrees centigrade, I will love it to have that material. Because now problem is that that's why people forget about. Uh, the chemisorb system because this option is very high and in a physisorb system it was very low so they want when we say room temperature li like um, if you go to the European country I don't think temperature will go up uh, maybe in summertime also like 30 degree right not more than that and in Indian, in an Indian contest also it doesn't go more than 40 degree uh, in the summer peak time, 40 degrees Celsius, uh, that's very rare. So we are around 30 degrees. So when we talk about room temperature, we are talking about 25. When I say it should be around uh, room temperature, it doesn't mean that it should be exactly 25 because uh, uh, the material should be in that range. So I need less amount of energy to take out of the hydrogen from the system. So that's the only idea. If it's around room temperature, then I need even less energy, right? So that's only the idea. It should not be exactly 300 Kelvin or 25 degrees. So can the hydrogen be intercalated in the, like the interlayer spacing in the 2D materials? Yes, yes. Like but the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in the beginning, that was the idea when these nanotubes came in the picture and nanomaterials. So they want to use this pore and it put the uh, intercalate or you can restore in the, between the layer. Problem was that uh, hydrogen is very nasty. It, it stick with the material and it's bound very strongly. So you can put it much, but when you have to take out, then you have to put a lot of energy to take out of the system. So that's uh, one of the issues, but this kind of problem can be solved uh, by, uh, by defect engineering also, I can tell you. What can I do with the catalyst? I can do also with the defect. 
I can tell you in hydrogen storage, defect material is much better than pure material okay. because those defect work as a catalyst and that will help also reduce the disruption temperature. Sometimes you don't need a catalyst. And when uh, even you talk experimentally, when they say titanium trichloride is a good catalyst, I don't believe in them because what they are doing, they are doing ball milling. And when you are doing ball milling, you are putting a lot of energy in the system. Maybe you are creating defects. The desorption going down because of the defect, not because of titanium, because you are grinding, grinding, grinding. So you create a lot of defect. Defect also works like a catalyst. So, so defect is very important uh, and we don't need pure material for hydrogen storage. So, so then alloys of TMDCs might be a good idea. Yeah, it will be good, but you have to be careful if you want to use for mobile application, you have to use the lighter one. Because if you do the heavier one, then you will have issue of weight problem. But those kind of materials you can use for other application like ocean traffic. That's the best place where you want to use. Hydrogen economy will work 100%. So you have to find just a way how you can use ocean water to convert into hydrogen water, how you convert. If you can find a cheapest way for desalination of this water, because when we're talking about the photocatalysis, we are talking about pure water in the lab condition. Water is not that pure. Because if I want to use your drinking water for produce hydrogen, then in India and in every country will have a problem for drinking water. So we have to find a way how I can desalinize the sea water and then I can use on the board. And if I want to use the hydrogen economy, it will work very well on sea ocean traffic as well as in submarines. There, I need more weight. So I don't have to worry about lighter material. I can take a material with one weight percent hydrogen. I'm happy because I need any heavy material for submarines. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, respected speaker, Professor Raju Ahuja, Ahuja had delivered has delivered a very informative talk on this topic of advanced materials for energy applications. Certainly it has been started from the, uh, this generation power productions, storage and applications. And it has been initiated from the battery itself that how in battery, how it works. And uh, thereafter it has been proceeded for the hydrogen storage phenomenon and how can we store hydrogen in different way that has been just figured out, that just has been explained by sir. And at the same time, the uh, problem associated with this hydrogen storage in terms of that uh, in the gaseous format, liquid format and solid, especially in the solid, how can we store, how can we uh, clump those hydrogen with other alloys are metallic substance by which it can be stored in a minimum volume and with minimum weight by which it could be utilized for certain device applications where it could it could not make their weight heavier as well as the 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 that system is going to be lighter as well as the, they are going to occupy a minimum space at the same time sir you have actually just discussed with us not like a, that you are a speaker at that time, that time you have discussed friendly with us that we have asked so many questions and maybe that questions may not be at that level, but we have asked and you have just uh, rectified it and you have just explained in a very, uh, very, you can say, pleased manner. So thank you, Fasar, all these such types of uh, answering the questions, what we have asked. Uh, lastly, actually, I would like to thank uh, patron of session, Professor Tiwari sir, who is our motivation and source of inspiration behind this series of webinars. Thanks are also due for today's respected speaker, Professor, R, uh, Professor Rajiv Ahuja, Director IIT Roper, for such a wonderful talk and sparing his valuable time from his busy schedule. I also thank all the audience for careful listening of the talk and technical stop for smooth functioning of this webinar. Last but not the least, 
my heartfelt thank goes to them who have involved directly or indirectly with this webinar so now i would like to request to you all please rise for national anthem <laughs> Okay then uh, thanks uh, for everything thank and so much